meeting is being recorded. Okay, welcome back everybody for a final, well, I guess I shouldn't say final because we're gonna have one more meeting to look back, but this is final meeting in terms of going through the text. And I again wanna say thank you everyone for sticking with it. I know it's been a long, um, a uh, long book, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. And I'm very curious to find out how, how you've enjoyed the ending. I think we have a lot of uh, a lot of things to discuss there as well. So I look forward to today's discussion as always. I'm curious what you thought, how Dostoevsky ended the demons. And of course we uh, we have to again, probably raise the, uh, the question of what are these demons or who are these demons, uh, whichever way you wanna yeah, and they all happily, well, not really, right? <laughs> In fact, <laughs> let's let's start with that. Uh, let's. Uh, this is, I think, one of the bloodiest uh, novels of Dostoevsky. And just to prove this point, I want to quickly share my screen. So we go back to the cast of characters. Let's see here. Wait, can you see this? All right, so this is uh, what we had on, I think, <laughs> The last time, and I just put in in a red line, put a red line across all the people that are dead now <laughs> that we have started with. And, you know, you can see how many major characters did not make it in this novel, uh, quite a few. Uh, and of course, in this last part, uh, we said goodbye to a lot of the main characters like Nikolai Stavrogin, famously Stepan Trofimovich, Pavel Kavinsky, and of course, Kirillov, Shatov, uh, I mean, we, we just had many, many casualties of war in this, in this, in this uh, not war, I should say, but casualties of, of this demonology, a demonic influence. Um, and um, I'm very curious, again, just to hear your thoughts on both the literary quality of this and the just the emotional reaction you have and just any kind of opinions and thoughts, reflections on, on this whole, whole plot and how it developed. Uh, I think we have a couple of interesting areas that we can go to today. Again, I, I'll leave it open to, to the group to, to explore. But what, what I thought was interesting was the, uh, again, Kirillov, just before he took his own life, goes into this long justification of his philosophy and his, his idea of killing himself. And again, you know, if you guys want to revisit that, I think it is interesting. It is, he has some interesting thoughts there. Not... I don't know if it's terribly new to what we've been talking about, but it, it, it is interesting nonetheless. Um, then we have a very interesting, tragic, comic, in some ways, passage about Stepan Trofimovich and his de final demise, his sickness. But in, in just before that, before he dies, he uh, makes very several many interesting pronouncements about his, his life, um, what he's thinking of, uh, his thoughts on his failures and maybe his successes in some ways. And he finishes with some thoughts on love and idealism and uh, grand idea that justifies our existence. So again, just another area that we could perhaps uh, go into. And then of course, the, 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 the actual mechanics of, of what's happening with Shatov and with Kirillov and with uh, Pyotr Verkhavensky, who is obviously now, it's clear, the mastermind behind all of the, all of the um, uproar and the demise of, of this town's uh, elite and society in, in a lot of ways, and all these other murders, brutal murders of Lebatkins, uh, the death of Lisa. I mean, you can basically say that this whole thing is his, his uh, uh, brainchild. So... With that, I'm going to go to um, CJ and maybe uh, Doug afterwards to comment, and then we'll open it up to, to you guys, to the rest of us, uh, to, to see what, what everybody thinks. CJ, floor is yours. Yeah, so um, I, like I've done the last few times, I'll do a brief comment on each chapter. Chapter five was entitled A Lady Traveler. It's uh, Shatov's wife, uh, Mary Shatov. And again, I was distracted or surprised by the narrator's inferences. 
for example, he says at the beginning of the chapter, you know, Shatov was willing to give his life to see the beast crushed as he put it himself. But who would have informed Anton Gavarov that Shatov had said such a thing? Um, you know, would it have been... <laughs> Uh, Kirilov? No, Kirilov's dead. <laughs> Gavarov couldn't have, <laughs> you know, I, maybe I missed that part of the novel where, uh, the explanation how Gavarov could have known. But as I, as I've been thinking about this strange narrator inferences, he, it, it seems in hindsight, Jeannie helped me a little bit here, um, understanding that last chapter, I haven't gotten to chapter seven, Stepan Berkovinsky's last trip. Uh, how did that make sense? And it seems as though the whole novel might be, it's not really clear, but it might be that Anton Gavarov is brought before the tribunal or whatever they have with the police trying to figure out everything that happened. And this is his testimony. And he makes up, as we all do, a lot of stuff that we can't possibly know when we try to fill out a story. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, that's a little demonic maybe. Um, so um, then, um, Shatov's wife, you know, I was reading this chapter five on Shatov's wife and she has a baby. And after I finished reading the chapter, I'm like, oh boy, what's going to happen next? And I said, you know what? Dostoevsky is going to kill off Shatov with Peter Verkovinsky's harebrained, harebrained murder plot because he introduced in chapter five this dramatic way to have your main character become a father and have his wife come back to him and the only reason you would do that is if you're about to kill him off uh, so i thought the high drama made it too predictable right right oh yeah <laughs> you have something yeah. there. you definitely have something there. <laughs> i mean it was still a little uncertain but it, it just, it just, you know, I was able to anticipate Did you feel bad, that. CJ? Huh? Did you feel bad? Um, Did it work, in other words? <laughs> you know, I, I would have I liked the novel where the, the movement realizes the poisonous nature of their rogue commander and, you know, finds a way to intervene as several of the characters almost did, including Kirilov. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, chapter six, An Eventful Night, is the murder of Shatov and uh, the dramatic um, uh, scene where Kirilov indeed finally does write a suicide note, although it wasn't clear until the very end that he was going to do it. And then he does this strange game with Peter where he doesn't commit the suicide right away. Peter says he couldn't have killed himself. He's not there. <laughs> oh, my God, what a strange scene. And then Peter uh, uh, leaves town. Uh, so that's chapter six. It's full of drama, but I don't know what themes or whatnot you can talk about. Um, I didn't come up with any. Chapter seven, Stepan Verkovinsky's last trip. Um, as I mentioned, this, this chapter seems to uh, fill in the, the plot, uh, you know, justifies the plot of how uh, Anton Gavarov is providing testimony to exonerate his friend Stepan Verkovinsky, who, with all the murders and, and suicides, 
the police are trying to figure out what happened, so they interview everyone associated with and uh, Anton Gavarov, of course, attended that um, uh, meeting at Virginsky's, and he um, uh, he was at the ball and and uh, with uh, friends with Stepan Verkovinsky's group. So he gets interviewed in the novel. Is I guess his testimony. That's you know. But my goodness, the police should have edited more. Was he there at the murder? <laughs> Um, I forget. Um, you mean Liza? Oh, no, I mean, no, no, um, that's just the five. Um, so the we get this dramatic kill off in chapter seven where, um, the uh, of characters at the at the end, um, Berkovinsky dies, and I guess Stavrogan doesn't die until chapter eight. Yeah, um, the last night, yeah, the last right. Um, this dramatic. I also use reuse the word harebrained uh, for both his son and him. Uh, his escape, you know. Why is he leaving? Jeannie, Jeannie and I talked about this on our walk, and Jeannie said he was leaving because the police raided himself and maybe he was afraid. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Why did Stepan Verkovinsky just up and leave? Uh, and then we get this overbearing, tone-deaf courtship with Sophia Ulitin. What the, you know, I, I almost wanted Sophia to kick him in the groin and escape, but no, she can't leave him. And and then Vivara Stavrogan, um, you know, after this dramatic scene where she kicks Sophia out and then brings him back in, she finally permanently settles in her estate. What? That was, that was uh, hard to sort through. And then in the epilogue, we have this attempt at a wrap up, which basically just details all the suicides and deaths from, you know, Shatov's wife dies, the baby dies. And there's this very strange letter. Stavrogan writes to Dasha to go off and settle with him in Yuri, Switzerland. And when Dasha shows it to his mother, his mother's all, let's go to Switzerland. They're all going to go to Switzerland. Even though a moment ago, she said, didn't she say, I don't have a son, but then she wants to go to Switzerland. What was, okay, you now have my confusion. Maybe someone can settle these questions. <laughs> Well, CJ, thank you for uh, for outlining all of this. This is this is great uh, because it, it does you know, raise a lot of questions. I think you will be able to uh, will be able to discuss a lot of them. I do want to make a couple of very small um, uh, points about Sophia. I don't know if you realize it or not. She is the woman that was distributing those uh, New Test uh, Gospels, New Testaments, whatever. And remember that story where they put some pornography in her bag to sort of create this again remember we talked about sacred and profane it's very interesting that she comes out at the end this person who represents this monastic way of life you know very kind of devoted way of life and yes i do agree that it's very comical that stepan trofimovich is making all these advances to her show but it's, it's actually not clear to me whether he was um pursuing her in a romantic way or more in a um sort of like idealized beauty way, you know, like platonic, I would say almost a platonic type of uh, companion. Uh, and, and, you know, as much as, uh, as much as all the other characters in this novel are very much into uh, sort of carnal pleasures, it seems to me that Stepan Trofimovich is more, he is even on his deathbed, he is talking half French, 
half Russian. He has all these big ideas. He, it's not clear whether he's delirious or he's just being himself <laughs> uh, to, to the very last. And, um, you know, it's very, he's a very interesting character. Uh, you know, weak, in some ways admirable, in some ways, you know, there's so many thick holes you can poke at him. And again, I just love Dostoevsky for creating these characters that are very lifelike. You, like you could almost picture him. In some ways, he exemplifies maybe people from academia who are disconnected from, you know, the, this expression of ivory, you know, ivory tower type uh, person. Well, this journey that he takes, what is it if, if not a person from the ivory tower meeting people that he has been um, pontificating about for his whole, uh, entire life? And then he meets the real world mujik, and uh, you know, and and and, they, and not only do they literally speak different languages, you know, French and Russian, but they are so past each other. They they speak past each other at every turn. They don't understand what the other person is doing, and I think Dostoevsky is brilliant in that way. He he shows how fractured that society was at the time, and it was totally fractured in a sense that you have the peasants, the serfs. And they have a, they live a different kind of life and they're almost like in a different country, even though they occupy the same physical space, they're so far apart. They have no points in contact and they're not re really that friendly towards Stepan Trofimovich. If you notice, they were like, like asking you like, what is he doing? He's a rich guy, why is he mingling with us? Like what, what's, what's his deal? Uh, and you get that sense that he's in danger. He, he kind of starts to fear for his safety. And then he's, he's very relieved when he has this woman who can be his companion in some ways, and he tries to reach out to her. Um, Doug, do you, do you have any uh, thoughts that you want to share with us? Yeah, you're muted, Doug. Yeah, uh, I have a few thoughts. Uh, um, the body count is sort of as high as Hamlet or even Titus Andronicus. I mean, it's. Uh, it's startling and so much so that it, you know, people say it ends as a tragedy, but there's also, it takes a wild detour into kind of the Grand Guignol, which is the sort of late 19th century French kind of slasher plays really of extreme violence that were presented, you know, live in Paris in, in the late 19th century. There's a, it's sort of astonishing. I. I think what I like about the novel to a degree is what frustrates CJ, that characters do not behave predictably. You know, that's out of character that, you know, I mean, in theater, you get that all the time that, oh, oh, that's not in keeping with that character. And then like, but if you observe life, people are one thing and then they do something completely out of the box. And I think Dostoevsky kind of anticipates almost all the 20th century psychologists, you know, whether it's Adler's power or Freud's sexual drives or young spiritual elements. I mean, he, he kind of anticipates all of them. And Freud said the great writers of the 19th century predicted 20th century psychology, you know, whether it was Ibsen or Dostoevsky or all these people. And I'm sort of astonished by the inexplicable nature of the action and yet the human actions, as the demons disappear and die or run themselves into the water or whatever they do, there seem to be some human actions that emerge where Sophia, who's peddling the gospel, but there's also an ambiguity there that she starts to run away because of the scandal of the porno pornography. But it makes you wonder whether she's peddling both gospel to one audience and pornography to another audience and that they found this and she blamed other people in planting it. So, I mean, the narrator, I don't think can be trusted on any element here. And so, but she's also very human and she sees a fellow lost traveler and takes care of him. And mm -hmm. then Mrs. Stavrogan is ready to kill her because she thinks she's, and then realizes, oh no, this is a good woman and takes her in and actually, kept him alive long enough that she, Mrs. Stavrogan could see him again. So there are these inexplicable human actions, like the woman at the end of Crime and Punishment who sort of re redeems Raskolnikov, who may even have the same name. Isn't that name? No, it's Sonia or Sophia. Oh, I can't same name. Yes, yes, the prostitute, yes. 
Um, yeah, so it's it is it is very interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't think of, I didn't make that connection actually at all. Uh, Doug, but there's it. often a woman who brings some element of relief or salvation, or mm -hmm. and uh, it's only through her actions that Mrs. Stavrogan ever sees him again. Uh, yeah. And um, and she protects him against the innkeepers. It suddenly turns into Don Quixote, where Stepan is out there, you know ready to be the great nomad and uh, and fortunately finds a, a in the form of a woman a Sancho Panza who kind of <laughs> takes care of him and makes sure he's not robbed by all the innkeepers and all of that so it's 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 wild how many things he's pulling from and how much he's violating the rules of narration I mean that that was frustrating to me. I asked all the questions that CJ has asked, but I finally decided this is like late 20th century or 21st century narration, that, that, that it's totally faithless in the way it's written. It's just not, uh, just doesn't behave. The narration simply will not behave in this novel. So, right. so it makes you wonder about stories and storytellers and you know, and like media today, there's good reason. Even people in newsrooms will say, we don't follow the news, we follow the story. Does it make a good story? And they'll modify the news to create a good story, which makes me believe the demons, I used to say, were the stories that people tell each other. And I think that's true. But they're also the ideas. He makes it very clear that people get an idea and it possesses them and it makes them inhuman. Uh, the ideas destroy people. Mm -hmm. which I have, I'm, just, I'm wrestling with that. Uh, and uh, well, um, in the sense that I don't agree with all of Dostoevsky's hit, but the structure of it is brilliant. I mean, it's masterful. And, but everybody can bring their own experience to it, which is why you have Camus writing an adaptation from one angle and other people doing adaptations from other angles. It's, it's infinitely workable in terms of doing different hits on the story, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'll leave it at that other than, well, the carnage, Don Quixote, just, uh, and these odd, sort of as the demons disappear, there are odd, irrational human reactions. Everybody says, well, you're traveling, don't take on a stranger. She takes on a stranger, you know, and sort of protects him. And so it's... Uh, yeah, I guess I have to take, uh, you know, I. I I take for granted that I wasn't um, born in this country. I, 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 I kind of think that everybody thinks kind of like me, uh, not necessarily in a straight logical line, but hearing CJ, I guess uh, it is amazing how much of the, um, you know, the logic of Aristotle and the Greeks have permeated the Western culture to the degree that everybody thinks in a very kind of straight line, arrow cause and effect type of way. Uh, it actually made me think of a joke uh, or a, a, a funny story about, well, maybe it's apocryphal, but supposedly somebody, a Russian immigrant bought, uh, brought a pig into a, a, a middle school and put number five on it and let it out, <laughs> let it run. And so the whole day, the administration was looking for pigs one through four, <laughs> <laughs> just illustrating how, you know, this predictable sort of logical behavior. If there's pig number five, then obviously there's one through four somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I guess Dostoevsky, he, he loves to play on, um, I mean, it's just nothing makes sense. And um, it's a comedy of absurdities and comedy of error, but also a tragedy. Um, and part of it, it's, I guess, uh, it's the kind of like the history uh, that doesn't make sense, and therefore people are, are raised in that context. Uh, I see, uh, Chris, I see your hand, um, and Madeline. Uh, guys, if you could uh, type in exclamation points into the chat, uh, that way I can kind of tell who, who wanted to speak first. Uh, Chris, I'm going to give you the floor, and then Madeline, but uh, if you guys could, and then uh, Allison, uh, I'm sorry, Maritza and Allison, uh, that way, yeah, you guys could just type in exclamation points. Uh, into the chat. Okay. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Uh, you're on. All right. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I have a different take uh, or a different reaction to the book. Uh, so, first, I think Philip, I don't think uh, Stepan was actually, uh, 
I don't think as readers, I didn't get the sense of uh, something come to harm to him from the villagers. I think, you know, the book, the way, he, you know, my interpretation of his writing is the ideologies, you know, uh, where Stepan serves as a symbol, right? Because he's both the father of Pietro and he's also the teacher of, uh, of uh, Stan Rogan, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really... Um, these what I call like Western European influences was really at the core of the evil and uh, the natural original goodness is really was uh, was uh, Zukov and then it was the peasants right this is the original goodness of Russia that's mm -hmm. where it is and that's why even though you know he had an exciting finish at the end um, but other than the overcharging uh, landlords, right? Everybody else actually treated him with respect and treated him with you know, normal goodness. They were a little naive, but I don't think, yeah, you never get the sense that they were, you know, endangering him. I mean, they were just looking at him as an oddity, right? Um, yeah, but yeah. They, they, they were, so unlike the city people, they were actually looking for angle and how to take advantage of him, right? I mean, they were just observing him as oddity and they treat him with normal human respect. So that's kind of one view I got it from him. And the other thing I, I was looking at, I actually found most of the events, the way he set up to be very predictable, right? The, the way he set up his story, you know, like, so for example, he really play out, you know, when Pietro is going to commit this murder, right? I mean, all the way, it stretched all the way back, you know, when he was having the conversation with the governor, uh, and then he was like, oh, you know, spare me Chata, right? You can have everybody else. Spare. I mean, I mean, Rudy's, you know, but you know how he behaves where he always speak the opposite of what he actually wants, right? So that really means that he really wants Chata. And you just don't know why he wants Chata, but you know that at the end he's going to get Chata. So you pretty much know that from the middle of the story. And then it really just come down to a very painstaking, he lays out, how that story develops, right, from everybody's angles, whether it's from that small revolution committee, right, or it is from like you know the the angle from Stavrogan and the the angle from the surf. Um, so, um, I, so I always thinking that yeah, I mean like uh, it's like reading Joyce. I was thinking, well, you're a good writer. Uh, the reader has to conform to the writer, you know? Because he's gonna write or she's gonna write however they're gonna write. And then it's up to us to kind of like appreciate them uh, because they're not always gonna write in a, in a style that we're comfortable with, right? Um, but the, um, I think the biggest takeaway I have from it is, is, is really um, the demons are, it, the, the, the character participant, it doesn't matter. You know, whether it's Pietro or Stavrogan, it could be anybody. Right, I think that's really the point he makes. The ideas are already within us, um, and anybody can come along and activate it, and then it and then it just become more of a a train wreck in slow motion. You can mm -hmm. see it, but you really couldn't stop it. I think that's kind of like the if you are taking the position from the point of view of the narrator, that's kind of how you feel, right? You can kind of see the train tracks going to happen, but there's nothing you can do about it because everything is already in motion and you're kind of you just feel kind of helpless uh and also a little comical at the same time right because the way everything develops um, yeah there's that sense towards the end i don't know if in the beginning uh maybe there was still some hope but it, yeah but i agree with you there's a, a sense of sort of fatalism in this the way it unfolds and it almost like yeah i think at the beginning right he was talking remember like when when steph rogan was young like you know like they were giving this story mm -hmm. where you know, he he led this guy by the years, right? <laughs> and, and like and then like he, like like a sheep, and then and then and then bit his. Uh, I don't. I think the the governor was his uncle, right, or related to, to his mother, and he bit him. You know, and and it's, I mean, you you just said, oh, okay, so that's the premise. So if that's the protagonist, this is not going to end well, right? Because because the you know this is how you're going to have to take the story, right? Where it doesn't seem to have any kind of what I call redeeming qualities, right? He has redeeming exterior qualities, right? He speaks well, he, he looks nice. He's a very handsome person, right? Uh, and he's going to speak well, but he had these extremely disagreeable um, personal qualities, right? And, and that's, that's how you start. So there's no, I mean, the only place where you can have some hope 
I think the only place is when he talked to what's his name, Trugan, the monk. Uh, uh, Tihan. Tihan, Tihan. Yeah, when you take the Tihan, that was the only place where there's hope, right? Yeah, because yeah. It's, it's a was... pivotal point. It's a pivotal point in the novel in some ways yeah. because it's like halfway through, and if he conquered, if he took Tihan's advice, we we get the sense that maybe things would have been different. Yeah. Yeah, because he actually respected Tihan because I think there's a similar there's a similar way out offered by by Shatov, you know, while he was visiting Shatov and Shatov would say, hey, look, you know, you know, like um, maybe you should take my point of view, right? Since you don't believe what you said before already, you should you should convert back to God instead, right? And come with, you know, and, and just convert and come back with me. But he didn't respect Shatov the way he respected Tihan. Uh, and then he actually thought about it, what Tegan offered him. And so there you, there's a tiny little bit of hope there to say, despite everything, you know, all the horrible things that he did, if he had just taken Tegan's advice, this novel can end differently. But he didn't. And then that, it was over. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. That, that's very interesting. Um, Maritza. I actually think Madeline was oh, Madeline, me. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's why, yeah. Madeline and then Maritza, Ellison and Joe. Okay, thanks Maritza. <laughs> um, let's see, well, I thought, uh, I loved the ending. I mean, I loved it that everything came crashing down, you know, and it was like the end of Hamlet where you're like, oh my God, who was left? No one, um, practically. And uh, let's see, I thought the the young woman at the end who helps Stepan Trofimovich, uh, I thought she did it because she was a Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was in need of help and she helped him. And for her, it was really quite simple. And um, then because she had done that, she ended up with a wealthy woman taking her in. But she hadn't done it with any thought of really of gain or advantage. I mean, she was she was stuck in life. She had nowhere to go. She had no money. But uh, she wasn't trying to take advantage of him in any way. Uh, Kirillov, oh my God, his suicide. Um, I thought when when Pyotr uh, Stepanovich went into the room and saw him there in the corner, I thought he had hung himself. That's mm. what the description sounded like. And it sounded as if he'd hung himself in the corner and I was thinking, oh no, this means that the note about I shot myself with the gun, is it gonna work? And, and then all of a sudden he springs to life and you realize like he absolutely loathed Piotr, just cannot stand him. You know, he would, he would almost rather not die than have this be the last person he interacts with. So he does something just sort of bizarre and nasty. But what's interesting is that um, he appears dead and then he comes back to life. So in other words, I think that he is probably uh, supposed to be some sort of Christ-like figure. Someone who has said, I am, I'm a, a man, I'm going to make myself a God by dying, but he, he died, he looks dead, he comes back to life and uh, <laughs> he bites the guy on the finger. I did, um, and I, I felt terrible because, oh, oh, right, because at the end, Here's this whole long, you know, sort of romantic thing going on between Stepan Trupimovich and Varvara Petrovna throughout the whole book, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years. And uh, so now suddenly he's like someone staggering out of a divorce. You know, he's left because his pride is injured. She doesn't want him there anymore. And so he's just sort of taking up with someone, but all he really wants to do is tell her about his one great love. So then Varvara Petrovna gets there and she's like, she discovers that this is the case. And instead of saying, oh, I loved you too the whole time, she berates him uh, for, you know, but you smoked a cigar and you dressed up when I told you you were gonna meet so-and-so. In other words, you didn't show me that you were interested in that way. So it seems sort of illogical and irrational, but it is kind of the thing that might happen in real life. Uh, where someone goes, but blah, 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 blah. I'm oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's very true, Madeline. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, almost like uh, you know, two old spouses that have quarreled and lived with each other for a long time. They haven't lived with each other, but they have that sense of 
kind of old quarrels and old um, scores to settle and they keep coming, they keep reshuffling them back to the surface, you know? Yeah. And then uh, just one last thing, I'm reading um, a book by Ursula Le Guin called Words Are My Matter, uh, Writings About Life and Books, 2000 to 2016. And uh, she, has, she has some book reviews in it that she's written. One is about a book that takes place in the Second World War. Um, and here's what she says. She says, the moral desolation of the novel is unsparing, accurate, and absolute. It is far beyond cynicism. It is as irrational and unanswerable as Dostoevsky. Hmm. Yes, there's definitely the desolation of cynicism. I like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's just this irrational, unanswerable, living quality to everything he's done. I mean, next time I want to talk about and hear about the structure and all the foreshadowing and everything. Um, but the, the whole thing is really alive. The people are alive. The book is alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's with a minimum of landscape description, too. Right. Right, there's no landscape almost like, unlike Tolstoy, who was very big on that. There's none of that. It's all action and people. People are the landscape, I would say. Uh, okay, thank you, Madeline. Uh, Maritza, Allison, and then Joe. Um, you know, I, I do agree with um, Madeline in that the, uh, the novel really does a good job from a literary perspective. It's brilliant. The way we're fed things, it's, um, you almost don't realize it. And you're like, wait a minute. Um, you have to suspend your disbelief, I think, in so many instances. Um, and yeah, and the narrator, I, I stopped after the first few chapters. I was like, yeah, no, nope, I'm just gonna not try to figure out what this narrator is because he seems to be, um, anyway, yeah, I think he violates the rules of uh, narration in several different <laughs> directions. Um, these last few chapters here kind of, took on, for me, an air of the absurd. Uh, it was very odd, but I had that thought while reading it, but when I was done reading it and um, took a little time to reflect upon it, I actually think that it was a very fascinating way in, in which to feed to us, um, like, what he's trying to say, the, the overarching theme. I am left convinced that when he spoke of the possessed, the demons, his goal in all these crazy characters, his goal was to show us the different um, types of demons that can live and do live within each of us. Um, that's the, the view I got that. In fact, the, the strongest line to me was the one, you know, CJ brought it out almost anecdotally, but, you know, at the end of the, I think it's chapter seven. Um, no, I think it was already chapter eight, but the, the, oh no, no, it was, it was at the end of chapter seven and Barbara Petrovna, she snaps out, you know, I have no son. And it says, um, I have no son, Barbara Petrovna snapped out. And it was like a prophecy. And what I think we're being told like to me, that was a really strong line because it, because then in the next section, you know, um, her son actually died or he killed himself. But the, the weird thing is he died without giving the chance for the person to whom he reached out to run away with him to respond in the affirm affirmative or the negative, which was passing strange. And we also saw previous to that, this, action of Barbara saying she's going to go with that's telling us she didn't mean it so she spoke out into the universe a careless statement of absolute certainty and then she just forgot about it because she just was thinking it or maybe she wasn't thinking maybe it didn't occur to her that there could possibly be any effect to her having said so and what it made me think was that what we're being told here is that, you know, everything you touch touches something else. And so to move forward with, you know, a little bit more care or caution in how we're um, 
interacting with others and the world and ourselves, and maybe to be true to ourselves, because if we're not, you know, you may somehow, I've given a feedback. Um, no, if you, you may somehow um, get a um, unknown repercussion as it were. And so that was just a thought that I had. I, I felt like what he was showing to us is these are all the people. So, you know, the, this 20 year non courtship between um, Navara and Stefan, it's the idea of if you don't speak up, what will you lose out on in life? You know, what what is standing right in front of you that you're not seeing? And, you know, with um, Kirilov, I I really like what um, Chris said. The comment of um, that it seemed like uh, Kirilov would almost prefer to not die just so that he didn't have to have this person be the last person with whom he interacted he really his disdain and then that trickery at the end it was so bizarre but it was like a final insult as it were like because he had been telling um Piotr the whole time he was saying to him if I'm going to do this I'm doing it on my terms and you know but he wasn't being heard Piotr was not he was not hearing him he was convinced it was going to be his way and he was going to get his note and he wasn't hearing him so then in the end though Kirillov did get his way he forced it to be on his terms and um that was, he he to me is the one character of all these cast of thousands that he was very consistent um and he was very very much true to himself and I find it amusing because I'm also convinced that the author did not have any desire for me to view Kirillov as someone to admire. <laughs> because remember, he's, he's looking at this guy as a nihilist and he's you know, very religious. You, you get that the, the, um, there's also wo woven into all this um, theme. It's the idea that um, you know, if you don't believe in religion, you're kind of lost. But I really, that was, what struck me is that he he's admirable to me in his honoring of himself. He, mm -hmm. he, he knew what he wanted from the beginning and he went and I also the, the dialogue he has about how he is God is fascinating um, from a philosophical perspective. The idea of, I don't necessarily know that I agree with him but it's a sound logical discourse and the and again, it just it makes you wonder what exactly mm -hmm. are we being told here? Because you're you're when you look at it from the perspective of he's saying that he can see that he wields the power. So it's it's kind of like an argument against determinism, as it were. At least right. what I'm seeing it is that you know he's saying if there's no God, and a God is the person who's the um the one who controls me. Well, if I have no God, I am my God. And, you know, I know that that it's a very, nobody wants to hear that. It kind of like makes people cringe because, you know, the concept of a God has such strong connotations. But as I do with everything, whenever I see the word God, I remove it and I add in philosophy. And then it kind of, I can see that. I can see this statement where it's like, okay, if I stop my believing in an external philosophy that someone else is forcing upon me, I can take unto myself the mantle of a philosophy that I can live with. And I am the wielder of my own actions, my own decisions. I can see how somebody like that would find it. I mean, and then I, it makes sense to me from that perspective, why he felt the need to end his life. He wanted to be a martyr for the cause of his belief, his philosophy. And Maurice, I, I wonder, I, I, I thank you, by the way, for, for going there. I, I really like, uh, go into discussions of philosophy and ideas, not just like specific things that happen. Uh, I am, I'm just gonna put it out there and then we're gonna go to Allison because I know she's been waiting and then Joe. Um, here's a thought, I agree with you, but I wonder if you take this philosophy to its logical conclusion, whether it can only lead to suicide because you're only as free as your freedom ends in other words, where I don't want to say where other people's freedom begins, but 
it, 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 you know, freedom is only so far. And so the only free action you can take is the action of, or the, that you can morally justify is the action of taking your own life. Because everything else is kind of, yeah, you may like it to be deterministic from your standpoint, but you can't do it because you have the government, you have other people, you have all kinds of things you're stuck with, including nature of your own being as a mortal, mortal person. And so the only free act you can do is this act of suicide or like, you know, those monks that, that set themselves on fire to protest something. Anyway, uh, I'll just leave it out there. Uh, Allison, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, I was thinking when you were talking about the linear or nonlinear uh, way of this book, I thought, oh, that's why I love Russian literature because um, many people have told me that my brain is like a pinball machine that I'm like, Bing, 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 bing. So Russian literature makes complete sense to me. Like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's how my brain goes. Um, but so anyway, I have a bunch of these random things that all connect to one idea at the end. Um, so one thing about Kirill, um, I saw Doug put in the chat something about Hitchcock. I had the exact same thought as I was reading that whole scene where with Kirill, I was just like, this is just like Hitchcock where you don't know what's happening off camera, but you know that someone's about to die. And it really brought that to mind. Um, and then with uh, Stepanovich, um, with the young girl, I thought he was exactly like when like a man's wife dies after decades and like six months later, he marries somebody else. And you're like, what? Cause he kept saying, I can't be alone for a minute. I can't be alone. And, um, and then and he's going in all his, all his intellectual things. And she's like, I don't know what he's saying. And so like, clearly it would not have been happy if that had worked out, you know, they both would have been frustrated, but he just, you know, was hurt by Nirvana. So he just latched on the literally, you know, the very next thing, person he could find. Um, so there was that, but then also what really struck me was this end of his life confession of his love for her. And I just, you know, I mean, and what's so sad is like she couldn't even confess. And clearly, like I thought 600 something pages ago, they were in love with each other. It took him that long. He's about to die to go. Oh, yeah, by the way, you know, um, I mean, it reminds me of like you go to a high school reunion. Someone's like, I had a crush on you back when I was 12. I'm like, yeah, I want you to ever say anything, you know, so men do this. Um, <laughs> the other a little thing deeper I, than that, probably for them. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but the one, but back to the, the philosophy of this, what I really thought was like, I kept thinking about this whole idea of the five and, you know, within this group of five, it was Peter's way or the high, like everything had to be his way. There was absolutely no room for any individual thought whatsoever, just none. And I thought that the entire last 150 years of the planet have been about all these different people in every corner trying to decide what is the sweet spot between the rights of the individual and the rights of the community. And, and the thing is that when you've got too much individual, then like Nikolai, he's completely selfish and, and there's all sorts of problems that come from that. But then when you go to the exact opposite where you've got Peter and his five, and if everyone doesn't follow his orders, then um, he's gonna one by one, he's gonna kill them. Um, where they kill themselves out of frustration. So that, that's not effective. And that the best way to have a community is that when you can still respect the rights of the individuals. And then I was thinking this sort of connects to the other meetups we've done on mass society, because I was thinking that when countries were smaller, then you could make more decisions on a more local level and then it would suit everybody's needs. But when countries became these massive things and these you know, the British Empire, the Russia, you know, America, these, the more um, distant people feel from their leaders, the harder it is in a way to control them because they don't feel like their needs and their ideas are being met. So um, anyway, those are just some thoughts that I had. Nelson, this is actually really interesting uh, that you bring it, bring it up, this idea of community versus individual. Here's um, uh, what I was thinking about, maybe completely in a different way, but I was thinking, you know, in America, the conservatives are mostly interested in the individual liberties and the um, liberal typically are more interested in the community and kind of the kumbaya of being together and sort of like 
the community. But in Russia, it was the opposite. The conservatives were the ones that were saying, look, we got to preserve society, not individuals. We got to preserve the social order, preserve, 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 conserve, conserve, conserve. But it wasn't about individual liberties at all. It was about the status quo, the society, the, the cohesion that existed, whatever, whether it was very oppressive, it was very corrupt, it was a lot of things. But it was orderly and there was some uh, idea of kind of security and safety within that. Uh, the liberals, the revolutionaries were the ones that were saying, screw society, screw society ethics, uh, government ethics, like they call them. We are going to trample all of it down. We're going to uproot everything and we're going to build our new glorious society on top of it. Dostoevsky kind of was in those circles of the revolutionaries, reactionaries, the liberals, if you will, <laughs> of that era, uh, liberals for freedom, right? Right. Uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, right. right? The liberty, egalitarianism, and brotherhood. Um, and it's interesting to me how these terms have now gone 180 degree, uh, uh, have undergone a 180 degree turn. Today, you, you, uh, you think of a liberal as a person who is in fact <laughs> for community, society, let's, let's make big government and you know, make sure the government is overseeing every aspect of our lives. I mean, it's just hilarious to me in some ways, uh, yeah. but, but also to your point about um, a, a local governance, I think that that point is, is taken, but I would say in this particular case, we're dealing with a small town they already are small, they already are local. And what's happening is, at least to me, is I observe the disruption of conventions and rules of behavior that underpin it, that are kind of making it all work. And once those rules and assumptions and things are, are, are undermined, and again, I keep going back to the sacred and profane, once, the, once those building blocks of sacred and profane that actually underlie that, social contract are destroyed, it becomes, hey, you know, everything goes completely berserk. You have fires, you have murders, you have people are doing crazy, crazy things, killing themselves, killing others. And it's just, uh, I mean, in one sense, Dostoevsky predicted this idea of, of, of destruction that comes not from external force, but from undermining belief systems and structures of people. And I think it's right there with Nietzsche. Nietzsche was, this, I think, said the same thing. You kill God, and that's, you know, is, what's going to follow is chaos. Uh, I mean, he not, not in so many words, but he kind of believed that. But he thought it was a good, you know, maybe it was a good thing because then you have these supermen, kind of like Stavrogin, who will be free to kind of waltz around and exert, assert their own individuality, and wonderful, whatever, ego, egocentrism. I wonder if part of it is because... Um with America, you had these people, they left Europe. Like in, in Europe and Russia, you had the tradition was there for hundreds of years. Then you had these people who left, they went to a whole new place, destroyed everything or tried to destroy everything, started all over. And, and it was just a very chaotic thing. And it was like that for a couple hundred years. And then it's like the order started coming in. And if you, what's interesting with America is if you look, the places that tend to be the most liberal, are the ones who tend to be the closest to Washington, the center of power. The uh -huh. ones that, like cowboy country, you know, I mean, <laughs> they've never been controlled. I grew up in California. I, I think they, Doug will disagree with you there. <laughs> yeah, but they, they like, no, it's, well, no, they get to California. But even there, I mean, it's always, yes, they're liberal, but they're very innovative and they want to go their own way and create new things. Mm -hmm. And and they don't really, they, you know, there's always a culture of try different things. Right. Um, even if well, America is a different beast. I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, beast, it's just but, the history, everything is different. Yeah. So you can't really compare the two. But it, it's still fascinating to me how, how you have this emphasis on community and uh, individuals and the political spectrum just kind of keeps going like a little right. wheel uh, yeah. <laughs> with, with like a monopoly. You know, you, you keep going around trying to, where are you going to stop, right? Uh, yeah, and it's like 150 gonna... years of like, now we want this, now we want this, 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 you right. know. The, I never quite find that spot. Uh, that uh, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance uh, to speak. So, Joe, go ahead. And then we have Doug and Madeline. Yeah, I was actually going to go somewhere similar to where Allison was going. 
okay. um, with this idea with the individual and versus the community, because, you know, it comes at a point where Shatov is, you know, all of a sudden he feels reborn and he's going around, he's knocking on windows and he's like, you know, and, and he's, he's clearly not a threat at, to, to the group at that point. And everybody knows it's wrong to kill him, yet they still go along and do it. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of that kind of this collective, like this is how, and even uh, Chagall, uh, Shig uh, help me with the pronunciation, Chagallvillism, Chagall, Chagallov, Chagall, like uh, yeah, Chagallovism. Who's yeah. questioning <laughs> Peter? Who's like essentially questioning Peter about you know what's really going on around Russia? Mm -hmm. You know, are there all these cells and things along those lines? Like you start to see that everybody has these doubts yet they still go through with the murder mm -hmm. and and that's kind of, you know it, it really does it, it's this kind of there's nobody has their individual uh you know uh their own personal thought or will anymore to kind of counter what they know is wrong they're just going along it's kind of mob spirit and it, it's kind of it's crazy well, uh, but go ahead. I, I was just. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. remind you of that document I shared with you in the very beginning. Yes. The, 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 the revolutionary catechism. You know, the word catechism is actually a religious word, right? If you remember. Right. Uh, it's, right. It's the, a belief system. And what does this revolutionary catechism, which of course was uh, created by Nichayev, who is the prototype of Peter Yerkhavinsky, uh, what does this uh, catechism state? If you read it, one of the things uh, you'll know that one of the things that, that is stated there is that we have no, we do not regard ethics as they are today as valid. In other words, right. everything is below revolutionary goals and we will trample down the ethics, whatever they may be, the ethics of do not kill, do not steal, do not whatever, because these are all religious things that are meant to keep us in our chains. Uh, I'm just kind of, you know, extrapolating there, but, but the idea is there's nothing above revolutionary ethic. And what is the revolutionary ethic? Well, it's the fact that our loyalty is to each other, our revolutionary right. brethren, and everyone who is on the outside is a collateral damage to, to our goals. If they need to fall, they will fall. It doesn't matter whether, you know, this person has a child, a newborn child that, you know, or his wife is there. We don't care. It's, it's really, I mean, they don't say it in so many words and perhaps they're not presented as being unfeeling or callous, but but think of this guy, and especially uh, one of the most striking figures in that group is this young guy, uh, Erkud, Herkud, yes. Her, uh, who is a, a young no boy, yeah. basically. He's just a young boy of maybe like 19 or 20. And, and he has some sense of ethics. He, he gives some of his money that he earns, he doesn't earn a lot, to his mom who's sick. And yet he goes along with all of this and he's right. very chill. Which is that's the, the the one who that's so tragic is you have these young people who are infected with this ideology and they think that and by the way I was thinking of like uh, the guys in Portland and you know just the events of uh, several years ago where you had all these people bashing windows and throwing and it's not a very far cry from what Dostoevsky is describing these people who think that you know the current ethics system is just a made up fiction that is used by the the government to keep us in check. So big deal. We're going to do whatever we need to do to create our glorious new world order with egalitarian beauty and all the rest of it. <laughs> Except, of course, what they end up is creating a worse totalitarian nightmare <laughs> than they've ever experienced themselves, uh, as, as Shigalov himself admits, right? I start from the premise of total liberty, and I end up with total dictatorship or something like that, uh, which is why it's so, you know, so hilarious. It's very uh, much, so, mm -hmm, no, it's ahead. very much a dictator. I mean, kind of, that's exactly how a dictator rules, uh, you know, essentially, and getting rid of the collateral damage is just whoever that is. But it's, again, in this particular instance, they're going against their actual, what they, you know, it's not even, it, it's, somebody they know is innocent so, uh, the, deep down inside i feel like they know that is innocent mm -hmm. um that he's not really a spy or he's not going to turn them in um yeah. but um and, and and then there's this element of forgiveness that kind of is important i think both with uh, stefan and both and with uh, shatov 
as mm-hmm. you know that Shatov actually forgives his wife um, and wants to start anew. And there's this kind of this rebirth that is taking place. And yet this is the guy that gets killed. And it's kind of like the one hope out of the group is, is murdered. You know, he, he, he's sitting there, you know, he's doing everything. He's pointing a gun. He's doing everything. He's like, uh, and, 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 and all of a sudden, you know, he, he ends up, uh, you know, being killed and it's kind of like hope dies with them in a way, mm. uh, even despite his, you know, he's forgiving again, he's forgiving his wife for, you know, having a child without him, uh, essentially. Um, I, I can come back to this Stefan's conversion because I don't, I don't want to go on too. Yeah, long. yeah, we'll we'll have but, some more time. That's okay. Yeah, but the but the other but the other thing I think that is interesting is is comparing and contrasting the two suicides. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, between Kirillov and, and Stav uh, Rogan, because one Stav Rogan was actually being held up as a Christ-like figure, specifically, <laughs> like almost, and he, and like he is the savior of the revolution that he's going to emerge as this great leader and i feel like you know you have kirillov who's also kind of this christ-like figure in that he's like kind of sacrificing himself in the right, sense right, for right, the five sure. i mean sure. he's sacrificing himself for the five right and, and so that they're going to you know be essentially well, I, I don't know that he would agree with that because he insists on being his own man you know? well that's true that's yeah, true so he's not he's not be- in the words of Kant, he is not the means, he's the end in himself. You know, he is not going to agree to be means of anything for anyone. He is his own man. He's Ubermensch, right? Superman. <laughs> uh, he, right, but he, he's, he would be overcoming in that particular right, instance. So. Right, exactly. Yeah, but he, and he's not overcoming. He's, but he is a Christ-like figure because just like Christ died to kind of prove some point, I guess. Uh, so, yeah. Also, doing the same exact thing and in that sense yes he is indeed in his, well, in his mind it, only. it is interesting thank you for saying that because i actually in a way i looked at him as dying almost as a sacrificial way of dying kind right. of right yeah know, I, don't, I, I don't know that he, uh, he, I, he but you're right as the, it's, that does that doesn't work with the philosophy right. that he essentially espouses right so i guess that I wouldn't, I would have probably here's, here's a that. thought. Here, here's a thought also about this. Maybe because Christ did not die for his own sort of self-actualization, but actually was supposedly for some other means, his ideas are still discussed 2,000 years later, whereas somebody who dies just for proving some private point is right. left behind in history. You know, that's maybe kind of the point that if you just focus on self-actualization, you're left behind in history. But if you focus on doing things for others, as, as crazy as it might sound to somebody like uh, Kirillov and maybe a lot of other people there in that group, it actually leaves a legacy that is lasting. Um, just a thought. <laughs> no, I, I'm actually writing that down because it, it, it's, I, I completely, I don't want to say completely misinterpreted, the suicide, but I think I attributed some of my own thoughts to it when I and I and I and well, we'll, when I was we'll, reading we'll, it, we'll, we'll in a way the that. suicide. Letter. I mean, even reading it, I had to catch myself in a way. It's like mm-hmm. almost like I, I had my Catholic upbringing coming out <laughs> with with especially with Shatov. Like, oh, he's taking on this woman who's pregnant and it's not his i'm like it's, it's like saint joseph or something right, right, like, right, right, for sure. I, I really i almost had that feeling and in a way i was like oh he's he's he's, he's joseph yeah 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 he's, and they right. killed him and they yeah, you know they right, yeah. and he's the hope he's gonna raise the hope uh, and yeah. and then his wife dies as well and uh, and his baby dies it's it's kind of um uh, you know, so I, I kept on having to catch myself m- multiple times with that is uh, putting my own, right. projecting my own uh, right. thoughts onto this. But anyway, right. well, um, thanks, Joe. That, that, anyway, there's my, fun. and we'll come back to like the conversion of uh, Stefan is, I think. Or, yeah, yeah, no, think for sure. For sure. For sure. Uh, Doug, Madeline, and uh, Jeannie. Well, all these ideas are really uh, interesting to me. Uh, I wanted to comment a little bit on Stepan leaving, I think it's because he realizes he's disappointed this woman he's been 
uh, projecting love onto, but realizes maybe he's just been a vampire and living off her all this time. And there's a shame there that I think he goes, I'm going to do the heroic thing. I'm going to leave. And he's ill-equipped to leave or travel the roads or do any of that. But he heads out. And I, 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 there's something really modern in the psychology or ancient in the psychology. I don't know, because it's a little bit Freud does it in one way, Jung does it in another. But the projection of his ideal feminine which Jung would say the male soul is female. It's an anima figure. And so he seems really fluent at projecting his anima onto different women that show up, even Liza a little bit when he meets her on the field. It's almost like he could get attached to her. And then he gets attached to Sophia. And then, then uh, Mrs. Stavrogan shows up again and he's completely reattached to her. You're my only true love. I mean, it's like this thing that he projects. And Jung also... I think in uh, the early founders of Alcoholics Anonymous went to Jung to ask him about alcoholism. And he said, it's a disruption in the relationship to God or even to the feminine. And so it's interesting that uh, Stepan is also something of an alcoholic. He's like many of the radicals, he drinks and he gets grand ideas, but he doesn't really follow through on many of them. And uh, it's sort of a terrifying character in that way. You know, uh, uh, so this ability to just instantly transfer the energy onto some other woman, and that he, after he leaves that estate, he, you know, that disruption of his relationship to any, and he even throws it onto the woman he's engaged to for a week. He's buying fancy, for a day, he's buying fancy clothes and perfuming himself and getting all, you know, he, you know, he's just got this very fluid ability to completely transfer his allegiance, his romantic allegiance. Mm -hmm. So that to me is really interesting. I'm, I think it's very lifelike. I think a lot of guys are like that. I, I yes. find some of that in myself, uh, believe it or not. I, uh, I, I uh, you know, you meet somebody exciting and you have this sort of uh, fantasy going on. Uh, and I think it's very human. Uh, and Dostoevsky picks up on it. Of course, Dostoevsky himself, as we know, have been with many different women throughout his life uh, and has married his secretary and uh, has had uh, children by, uh, by uh, many women. So it's, uh, um, it's yeah. Um, actually, I, I take it back. I think he only had children with, with his uh, second wife. But, um, but point being is that uh, this, this idea of these men who are men of ideas and artistic and how they 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 latch on like you mentioned like that, I think that's that's spot on that's that's very interesting and well it you know, also relates to the ability to project onto a god you know so there is that one section I have to go back and find it where he's talking about the Roman Catholic God the Greek Orthodox God the Roman mm -hmm. Orthodox God the Protestant God and the ability to transfer energy to one or the other and what's natural or what's real and every country has to have its own God I mean that's a fascinating section. Mm -hmm which when the world is, we're all refugees in a way these days, I mean, that gets very confusing as to what God should you be following. Right, right. I think, yeah, okay, th okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Madeline and then Jeannie and then uh, Maritza. And then after this, uh, we're gonna go to our breakout rooms just so that we can uh, discuss some of these ideas in a more tight circle because I feel like everybody has so much to share. Uh, and we probably want to give everybody a chance to to discuss. So uh, go ahead, um, Madeline. Yeah. Uh, wow. Thank you, Doug, uh, for that about the projection of the anima. Uh, I agree. Uh, I was thinking about. Okay, so Shatov, how could he have been so blind? Here is the woman he loved in his youth, basically. So someone who he was in a, re, a short, intense relationship with, they just kind of drifted apart due to circumstances and now she's back. He's overjoyed and he somehow overlooks the fact that she is nine months pregnant and is wondering why she's ill. And it actually reminded me of um, Stepan Trofimovich uh, because neither he nor Shatov is especially worldly in their own way. Like when Stepan, he's on the road, the cart's coming, he's laboring through a conversation with the peasants. These are very practical people. 
They're like, where are you going? How are you planning to get there? And he's burbling on in French and he's thinking about <laughs> ideas and it, it's sort of hit uncomfortably close to home as I am like crossing the streets here in New York City thinking about Dostoevsky and all of a sudden there'll be someone like pulling at my elbow because I'm about to cross against the light. Uh, so that was sort of, I could relate to it. It was, it was kind of embarrassing. Um, and so that unworldliness of Shatov uh, and his generosity of spirit, that he was perfectly happy to have this woman back. He would have been delighted to raise her child as his own. He would have loved to be a family with her. And whose child was it? Well, remember, right after she gave birth, she turned to him and said, Nikolai Stavrogin is a scoundrel. Yep. So this was Nikolai Stavrogin's child. Most likely. Yeah, most likely his child. And so at the end of the book, basically Varvara Petrovna has briefly had probably what she most wanted, which was a grandchild, someone to carry on the lineage. She never knew it. Stavrogin may never have known it. Anyone who knew about it is dead. Um, and it does seem like that's part of the, um, I think part of Dostoevsky's point was sort of the, the pointless waste of it all. Um, the, from the people who just want to tear everything down, the demons, mm -hmm. um, who are, yeah, they tear, they, they didn't actually succeed in tearing down any of the structures that they hated, but they did succeed in destroying individual people. Yes. Um, I think that uh, when, when Shatov was killed, um, the part where he was shot was incredibly brief. It was just a couple of sentences really. Mm -hmm. But everything surrounding it had that sort of clumsy, chaotic, what happened in this crowd kind of feeling. And um, you know, this person was here, that person was there. And um, different people's reactions to the, to the killing, how they react afterwards. And um, I thought that it had been foreshadowed a very long time ago, back when uh, Nikolai was talking to his wife and saying, and she, and she said, oh, I had a, a dream or maybe it was a vision or, you know, I'm delusional about you. Um, but the, we have a baby. We had a baby. I don't know if it was a boy or a girl. Hmm. And it was taken off into the woods and killed. Hmm. Anyone else remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, my yeah. Maybe that kind of... yeah, yeah, yeah. So we already have um, a dream or an ideal, kind of a divine child being taken off into the woods and killed. And um, I think also in that scene where Shatov is killed, uh, the narrator the third person narrative voice says uh, that this took place at Skoreshniki um, because this was the center of everything that happened, mm. which I hadn't, I hadn't really seen the book from that point of view. But when I think, when I was thinking about it during the, the, con the conversation earlier, when people were talking about politics mm -hmm. and how that estate kind of encompassed the political goings on of the time how uh, there were some peasants who were still there. There were some freed peasants. There was the old butler retainer. Uh, there was the educated woman who's gone off to a city for a while to see if she can make a bit of a splash. Um, so all of these things, it's where, um, uh, what is his name? Uh, Stepan Trapimovich, it's where he lives. And so, I guess a lot of things do take place there, but I think that it was also, um, it, was, it was even more representative of, of the time and the political era than the town was in a way, if, 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 or at least that's what he think the author thought, uh, because that's what he said was that Skoreshniki was uh, kind of at the center of it all all along. No, that's that's actually very interesting, Madeline. That you, uh, I, I haven't. I, I need to rethink that that statement about Skoreshniki being the the center point of the whole thing. You know, I 
you know, if we map it out, the kind of, you know, we're given hints as to different things, what, how they're situated relative to each other, it probably will turn out that it is the focal point just because of how many people either visit or live at her estate, at Varvara Petrovna's estate, and also how close both Stepan Trefimovich and uh, the rest of the town and how, in other words, how, how everything is situated relatively uh, s close to that area, it would probably be very central. And of course, Stepan Trefimovich himself is kind of living on her good great off of her good graces. And he is the mastermind, not mastermind, he is the, the, the father of all of their ideas. He taught half of them uh, as, as children, right? We said that in the beginning. And so there's definitely that centrality from, from that standpoint as well. I mean, some of them are either, uh, they are beneficiaries of Stepan Trofimovich education and ideas, or they are beneficiaries of Varvara Petrovna in a sense that she is taking care of them, right? Like Dasha, even her son, um, Shatov. I mean, she is like this, um, magnate right she is the benefactor of the arts and and so forth and so yeah i think i think you're absolutely spot on there with that observation that it is a central point it's a very interesting yeah very interesting and um point. she even did that at the end um she mm -hmm. just she just took in everyone she just sort of looked around her and said okay who's left right you know, and she I'll, I'll, Sophia. yeah uh -huh. yeah and 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 dasha right uh, who who um Nikolai Stavrogan used the same ploy on her as he had used on his wife. I bought a place in a gloomy valley in Switzerland. Won't you come away with me to there? Hey, it's for like, once, come on, dude. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, used, you used it up. You already used that one. It's to work. Maybe I got a place in a in Swiss, Swiss chateau. Are you coming? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, Maritza, you're next, and then we're, we're going to go to breakout rooms where we could continue this lively, lively discussion. Uh, wasn't it Jeannie? Oh, and, I'm sorry, sorry, Jeannie. Uh, and then, and uh, Maritza and Allison. Yes, I get lost in the excitement. Uh, Jeannie, please well, go actually, ahead. Actually, it's, it's better if I go before Maritza because I have a question. I think the last time she said something that um, Dostoevsky is trying to say that religion is very is important to keep communities together but don't quote me on that but i do think that the book is really subservient to his messages and so when when the wife and baby were killed off i was just like you know why this is unnecessary but actually it's important to show it makes shatov so much more um valuable that he has a child and and wife because then when he's killed, you can see how the repercussions, you know, that, that actually they can't even survive without him anymore. Right. So um, the other thing was that I was surprised because Maritza thought it, that I knew he was religious, but he seemed so sympathetic to uh, atheists really. And, and even nihilists. I mean, it, it was not, he's not really preaching against these ideas. I mean, he was really very sympathetic because I didn't even think that the religion thing, I mean, at the end, when it comes down, you could see with Stefan, he turns kind of religious. And um, actually that reminded me a lot of the, of Dante also said that love was the most important thing. So that, and I remember my own dad said that too, as he was getting older. <laughs> That you know, love was the, the, uh, <laughs> the main reason to live. Yeah. So, uh, but I I do think the messages are the primary thing that he's trying to get across in the novel, not just to excite us and use right. his little. Well, I, I want to say something about that, Jeannie. Uh, I think that's a mark of a great person and a great man who has enough breadth of the uh, understanding of the world and ideas. Not even if you have, uh, he has his own sort of viewpoint, he is able to show us the breadth of different feelings and ideas. And if, of course, his own life, he started out, I imagine, when he was a very different man when he was 18 or 19. He was hanging out with all these revolutionaries. He probably might have been an atheist or maybe an agnostic himself. And his um, belief system changed very 
drastically after the experience that he went through being almost killed. And then, you know, we, we, start, we started out with that. You know, his own personal experiences were so dramatic and so uh, uh, fundamental to his maybe outlook that it really broke him, I think, in a lot of ways. And of course, I, you know, I can, I can only imagine the kind of horrors that he experienced in, the, in those labor camps and, and the rest of it. But uh, the bottom line is, I think he experienced that very wide gamut of beliefs, and therefore he, he could be sympathetic to people coming from different uh, experiences. And I agree with you, he is very sympathetic to atheists, to nihilists, to all of these people. He tries to give us that's why I think he's a great, great artist. Uh, he he paints, he doesn't create a caricature. He creates a full blown person because he realizes that no matter what you believe, you are still a person, you have value as, and maybe that's a Christian belief in itself that everybody has value fundamentally. And uh, even though I may not agree with this belief that you have, like, I don't think Dostoevsky agrees with Kirill at all. <laughs> it's probably polar opposite, but, to him, he paints Kirill in such a sympathetic, as a sympathetic character. Everybody who reads this book notes that. I, uh, it's not, 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 not anything new or, um, you know, we, so I think we all got it. We all got it that he's very sympathetic towards him. And he is anything but religious. He is kind of anti-religious in some ways. Uh, um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, I think it's a mark of a great, great writer that he is so, he, he's so good at painting people in these, you know, highly dimensional um, portraits that are not just like, you know, a stick figure cartoonish uh, misrepresentation of a belief that you don't personally subscribe to, you know what I mean? And that, that is so unusual in today's world, right? We, you know, we, we have straw men everywhere. You know, I don't believe with something, so I'm going to build a straw man of this, this belief. And then, you know, and then, of course, you denigrate people that are, that are espousing to it. Espousing it, rather. Um, Maritza, go ahead. Um, to me, it was super clear throughout the entirety of the movie, the, the movie, the book. That <laughs> <laughs> that's my version like of the movie, movie, right? <laughs> book. Um, yeah, the, it was very, very clear that um, the author himself was coming from a religious background, and and that he was espousing that one as the the, the higher uh, or the better path as opposed to the um, the other um, faculties. I will say I do agree with you, Philip, that the um, it's so well done. He does give he gives a lovely voice to the other perspectives, but um, it did it was not a it was not um, enough for me to remove um, the uh, the perception that he viewed. Um, the religion as uh, the higher good, as it were. Um, that's, I just, I saw that even from the very beginning. It's just the way right, I, I read right. it. No, it's, I guess, you know, if he was trying to communicate that he did a good job. That right. Way. That, that, I mean, that's, that's what I thought he was uh, communicating. I do right. want to say one very quick thing, Andy. Um, you guys spoke for a little bit about um, the fickleness of um, Tafan um, and his, uh, his amours as well as Anima. And I think that that was also a, again the brilliance of this author right they it was a it was a greater world view that we were being fed a little bit there perhaps in the idea of um um what you could what you could possibly be open to and what would um you know finding uh i mean maybe happiness i'm not sure happiness is something that we were fed at all in this book but um, <laughs> I don't think we were. But no it, happy end. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. But I, I, I just, I really think that it's a matter of the, the thing with um, Shatov and his, his wife and her. So she, they were married and we were not told why they got separated or whatever. But then she comes back and she's like two seconds away from giving birth. And then he dies anyway. And then both she and the child dies what I was left with, and perhaps this might be my bias, because again, I saw strong um, overturn tones of religion. My view of that scenario was that the reason that she came back and she had a child and that Shatov was so overjoyed by it and so willing to mm -hmm. take on the mantle of father mm -hmm. was that it was to show that what you do in the past still matters today. So, you know, he had 
these other things that led up to his um, murder. Was, and yeah. he couldn't erase those things just because now he had, you know, reason to eschew it all away and he want nothing to do with it. It's still going to find you. It's kind of what I saw it as. Right. right. Thanks. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, Allison, can you uh, remember your point uh, till after we do the uh, the breakout rooms or uh, is sure, it short enough to yeah. if That's you want to? I, I can wait. It's okay. 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 So I, I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to discuss because uh, uh, we're running out of time here pretty shortly. Uh, so we're going to go out to, uh, we're going to uh, go to breakout rooms for about half an hour, maybe a little bit less, uh, uh, where you can discuss all these things in a, short, um, in a smaller context. And then Allison, I will give you a chance to speak right after we come back. Okay. So uh, you'll be prompted to join a, a room and Hopefully we'll see you all there. Um, Allison has conceded her time. As she said, her comment wasn't that important after all. So Allison, if you change your mind, uh, feel free to, to type in an exclamation mark in the chat. We'll give you your floor back. I, I do want to uh, read some uh, something and it has to do with uh, the conversation we had in our group, which is this uh, a, a type of confession, I guess, or, or realization that Stepan Trofimovich has before he dies. So let me, uh, uh, Joe, I see that point. Let me, let me just read this and then I'll, uh, we'll open the floor to everybody else. Um, so let me share my screen so you can see what I'm reading here. So this is, um, this is, uh, Stepan Trofimov is talking to, uh, is it Sofia or, yes, Sofia. Uh, and, and he says, that where it's underlined there, a great many ideas are coming to me now. You see, it's just like our Russia. These demons who come out of the sick man and enter the swine, these are the, all the sores, all the contagions, all the uncleanness, all the demons, large and small, who have accumulated in our great and beloved sick man, our Russia over the course of centuries, centuries. Uh, then he says, talks in French, I'm not gonna repeat that. But she will be protected by a great idea and a great will from on high, just like that madman possessed by demons. And all these demons, all the uncleanness, all this filth that has festered on the surface, all this will beg to enter the swine. And perhaps they have already entered them. That's us, us and them. And my son, Petrusha, of course, that's Pierre Piotr. Uh, and I perhaps am the first standing at the very head, and we shall throw ourselves, the madmen and the possessed, from a rock into the sea, and we shall all drown. And that's no more than we deserve, because that's precisely what we're fit for. But the sick man will be healed and will sit at the feet of Jesus, and all will look at him in astonishment. So um, this passage is the passage I was um, uh, thinking about when we were talking in our group about this influence of history and the sicknesses and uncleanness that persists from centuries of either malgovernment or what I would call the sins of the people. And I think you know, in America, it's pretty evident that the sins of the, of the people are, you know, it'll keep coming back to the surface and they just never want to leave us um, unfettered from them. But Dostoevsky makes that same point about Russia as, as you know, Russia has a long history and there, there have been many, many sins of the past that have haunted it. And the fact that they are now sort of solidifying into these festering infections and entering into people's minds. And the sort of like this idea that people are becoming radicalized with, the, with ideas that are really not so much new but it's the old wounds that haven't really healed and been dealt with, all these things that haven't been dealt with. Now they just have a new beginning because of the new, whatever popular ideas that are in the air. So I wanted to, I wanted to bring that up uh, and throw it out there on the floor of discussion to see if anybody wants to pick up this, this, this mantle and, and uh, maybe discuss it. Um, and meanwhile, uh, Joe, go, uh, Joe, and then CJ, you guys go ahead.
You can actually let Allison go. Did she want to go? I mean, Allison, do you want to speak or forever call you? <laughs> right, was, but... I was I was just reiterating what Jeannie said about um, that. I think with um, Shatov that they really wanted to show him. You know, ex I, very few men want to raise another man's child. So the fact that, and especially because it was his wife who had a child with somebody else, and then it's Nikolai's child of all people. Um, so it really showed just how good and pure he was. And then for him to die makes you just, for them to murder him, it was just, you know, so tragic. Um, so that's, that was really all I was gonna say. Oh, well, but actually there's one other part that I feel like it, the, the family unit and the breakdown of these families was really echoing the breakdown of the society. So they showed it in different ways with like the, the fires, the families breaking down, and then there's sort of this like last attempt to get them all back together at the end. Like even Varvara and um, Stepanovich, you know, the, they're like almost back together and then boom, he dies. And and it's just so tragic that on all levels, like, you know, Shadow almost has a family and then they're all dead, even the baby. Like, yeah, Russians, they love to do that. They like to get your emotional heart in, a, in like a fist and then squeeze yeah. it even harder. <laughs> yeah, so you're like, I'm getting the happy ending finally. Like, but then, no. yeah, then you're supposed to have yeah, this yeah. cathartic moment uh, after yeah. it's been squeezed and you're, 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 you're picking up your heart from you know, a sidewalk. <laughs> then you're supposed to be all cleansed. <laughs> well, then I think he throw you a bone when he has Nikolai kill himself. You're like, oh, all right, well, at least he's gone. At least we got rid of that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, Joe, go ahead and then CJ. Actually, you can skip me now okay. if you're, okay. you're going to talk about this. I was going to be, I was going to ask a completely different question okay. that was coming out of our breakout room. So maybe I'll pose it later. Okay. But. Okay. CJ, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to address the issues on the table and then maybe Joe's question will be good. Um, let me start. Shatov is father. Uh, one thing is Shatov really liked Stavrogan. I mean, the whole interchange with Stavrogan and Shatov, and maybe he knew that Sh Stavrogan was the father and because he liked, and I get the feeling that Shatov, you know, loved his wife. I'm not sure I'd have to reread the novel and go back to the beginning when that relationship is discussed. But um, if, if he really loved his wife, then, you know, oh, so she committed a sin and had someone else's child. I'm going to stand by the woman I love now that she's come back to me. I, it's just a thought. Um, in, in our discussion, this relates directly to um, Phil's reading of... Um, Stepan Berkovinsky. I'm getting him mixed up with the sun, which is bad. Um, and and the demons. I I mentioned in our breakout on um, the August Strindberg quote: "Your words have entered the uterus of my brain." And and that that Maritza said that that summarizes the novel. Um, Maybe Strindberg understood the novel better than anyone, even though I don't. Well, think uh, I'm sorry. Did is that quote August Strindberg from a play, or was it just an essay he wrote? Or what? What is it? I I don't. I got the. I got it from Arthur Weinstein, a professor at Brown University, and he didn't give the full citation, so oh. we'd have to research that. Yeah, I, I like um, August Strindberg's plays. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, but what is it about the words that have entered the uterus of our brain in this novel? Is it the ideas? Is it, you know, I, I really have not gotten to the point of, of understanding the demons. I, I, I see elements of it, of course, and I and I love everyone's suggestion that the demons might be ideas, that there might be something about individual and community. Um, I I haven't played one thing. I'll add um, 
to, to one extent, the demons are the crazy things we do, perhaps for ideas or for beliefs or for, you know, which gets me to why did Kirillov actually kill himself? Once he realized what Peter's scheme was, if he's really such a good guy that the novel is standing out as someone that we should, you know, venerate in some way, why, why wouldn't he have just, you know, killed Peter instead of himself or killed Peter and then himself? Um, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know why he goes through with it in the end. It, it just be, so I'm well, just sharing my confusion. Right, right. right. Well, that's a good point. I, I'm, again, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you, have, if you think you have an answer for that. Um, I'm going to, uh, okay, Marissa, um, I'm just going to say uh, about this idea of demons versus and ideas. Well, you know, in, throughout history, I think it's been pretty pretty obvious that some bad, bad ideas can lead to even worse actions. So actions themselves are perhaps children of ideas. To use your metaphor of the words in the uh, uterus of the brain, words are essentially impregnating our brains with, with these thoughts, with these memes, ideas, uh, philosophy, but the actions proceed from that. And you know, there's so many examples. Uh, I mean, where can you you can look almost anywhere? I was thinking of the that uh, incident that happened during the Clinton administration, where you had the people, uh, the Dravidians, who who you know got themselves in the compound. Ultimately, why were they there? It, 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 nobody forced them to get there in the first place. But it was ideas, right? People believed certain things. They bought. They allowed those things to poison their minds and the consciousness, um, it's the same with any other idea, really. Um, so, but here is the kicker. Here is the part where it becomes a little more complicated than that. I mean, that, that is a kind of a truism. What Dostoevsky is saying is these ideas, these, they don't come from Mars or anywhere. They come from, from another source and they enter into so, well, he calls them swine, and then he equates himself with the swine. So he says, ideas come from some sickness, and he then identifies that sickness as a, uh, this history of oppression, of sins of a nation, and it, it metastasizes into individual brains and um, consciousness, and then it becomes action, and the swine, if, in his words, throw themselves off the uh off the cliff and kill themselves and maybe kill other people in the process um so that's where it becomes more interesting than just well you know people believe bad things and you know they do bad <laughs> uh, but, but bad then those, those demons are the same things that cause us to go to the moon and do all the you know make great art um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how you distinguish those demons from the demons that result in creative Well, in the words, I mean, I don't want to get too, too uh, religious on you, but of course, in the simple words of, of Jesus, you shall know them by their fruits. So, you know, if people are dying in the process, and like we're reading about, yeah. and, and uh, you know, it's a little different than putting people on the moon. I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I think that's a pretty good accomplishment versus, you know, people are uh, starved in Ukraine or, you know, uh, die in labor camps and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but taking a step back, again, this idea of historical, historic uh, history being the, the, if you will, the Petri dish from where these parent, these, you know, viruses, viral things grow is a novel interesting idea from Dostoevsky that I think was not there before. And that's why I wanted to see if anybody, if it echoes with anybody here in this group, because it's such an interesting point. And I think it's actually very true that history has a lot more to say about our present and our present ideas than, than we realize. I mean, in the United States, I've traveled, you know, north and, you know, I've been in the south and, and in New York, and the, the echoes of the Civil War are still here today. 
even so even in this country you know with its history that's not that that deep necessarily as like european countries but still you have an event that took place almost what's 150 more than 150 years ago 180 years ago uh well my math is off um uh, whatever so, but but the point so is on, let me let me just interject one more question i'm okay. not gonna comment on that um in in our breakout i mentioned the russian nihilist movement which is referenced in the play in the novel often mm -hmm. i actually lost track of in the end of the novel how you know russian nihilism movement isn't exactly the philosophical nihilism that i knew about before reading this novel and when I looked up in the beginning of the novel, I was tracing a bunch of the references I found in Wikipedia, an article on the Russian nihilist movement, and on several of the writers that Dostoevsky cites. Mm -hmm. I didn't read that far, and I didn't get it clearly in my head, but I have a feeling that something about the demons might be a commentary on the peculiar nature of the Russian nihilist movement versus nihilism as a philosophical or grammatical term uh, in and of itself. Right, right. I, I'm not uh, I'm not a student of that movement necessarily, but I do know that they, they you know there were a lot of Russian anarchist movements. Uh, some of them were nihilists as well as anarchists. Uh, most of them were not, to be fair. Uh, but but there were some more radical groups more radical anarchist groups that advocated violence and advocated like we talked about in the revolutionary catechism they advocated really uh, a, a, uh, amoral behavior not immoral but amoral where there is you know we're not beholden to morality of the ruling classes so to speak these ideas of course have never really left uh when i was at columbia we read this wonderful person, and I say wonderful in quotes, uh, but again, you may disagree. Um, uh, Fanon, a French uh, writer who talked, uh, who was the architect of the Algerian insurrection and, uh, you know, struggle for liberty in Algiers from France. Uh, and it was the same exact point he was making. He said, you know what? Um, all is fair in love and war, if you know, I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of what he was talking about. Like, we, we, there's no ethics. Uh, we, we've been subjugated, so we'll use any means possible to to throw off the yoke of the. Uh, and you know, people disagree with us. So this, this is a, like a really kind of sticky point. If you're going to dispense with ethics, who is to decide that the society you're going to build when you just destroy the old and start building the new? Who is to decide that the new is going to be worth building and destroying the old for? And that's the question of Russian Revolution. Because they killed off, you know, killing off people is really relatively easy. It's building something new that's worthwhile. That's kind of hard. <laughs> and especially when you realize uh, that whatever you build, in the words of Shigalov, is actually 100 times worse <laughs> than whatever you destroyed. <laughs> so that's the, that's the, uh, uh, the rub. Uh, Maritza, go ahead. And then we have Madeline. Uh, and then I don't know if, Joe, you, you want, um, did you want to comment afterwards? So Okay. Ah, um, so CJ's question about the, um, you know, the ideas being, you know, both um, ideas that destroy things and also ideas that, you know, take us to the moon and such, the creative flow, made me think of the concept of self-will. And, you know, that's, that is brought out by um, Kirillov. And in that scene, right before he does um, commit suicide, you know, there's a very, to, to me, very powerful, um, interaction between himself and Piotr, where Piotr says to him, you know, if I were in your place, I'd kill somebody else to show my own self-will, not myself, <laughs> um, because, you know, you might be, of, and he says, um, you could be of use to me if you, so he's, so Piotr is trying to tell Kirillov, you should kill somebody else and not yourself, but that's his fast thinking because he's become convinced that Kirillov will not commit suicide. And he goes, you can kill somebody else. I'll tell you who if you can't think of someone, which is, right. but the fascinating thing is what um, Kirillov responds. And he says to kill someone would be the lowest point of self-will. And you, 
show your whole soul in that. I am mm. not you. I want the highest point. And so I'll kill myself. And, and that's a fascinating, you know, you take that little bit of three sentences and go into a corner and, you know, chew on it forever because it's the idea. Like, so what, to me, the reason why Kirillov stands out from all of these other characters is this. He, mm-hmm. he has been, before he outright speaks about self-will and everything he says, he's been talking about self-will. I will do as I wish. I will do something that will benefit you, but I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for myself. Um, this is the inevitable um, projection of those things, which I believe, and as such, I will follow through. That's what he's saying every step of the way. And of every other character we're introduced, he's the only one. To me, I see that as a shining moment. I'm not convinced that the author meant to project him as heroic as I'm viewing him. So that that's my bias, right? Um, I think that it's, it's, and so what comes to mind for me is the idea that some ideas, you know, are our demons, mm-hmm. but some of them, don't have to be in it. And the difference perhaps is our own sense of self-will. If, if a, an idea gets into one's mind and we allow it to breed and to multiply, but it's not an idea we've accepted, then that becomes a demon, right? But if it's an idea that we, we have accepted, well, then that's the idea that is more the creativity I don't know if that's making sense, but that's that's my um, those are my first thoughts in uh, response to um, right. TJ's question. Okay, okay, interesting. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, who do we have? Uh, Madeline, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Marissa. Yeah, this is uh, also in response to what CJ said and uh, and you and Phil about uh, political nihilism. I was thinking that we we did have something like that here very recently. It was a very gentle version. Uh, it was Occupy Wall Street. Uh, remember all those people camped out in Lower Manhattan, mm-hmm. saying, "This is what is wrong. Here are the things that are wrong. They are wrong, wrong, wrong. We are here to call attention to it, and we are not going to make a statement about what we think should be done." We're not going to say democratic socialism is the answer. We're not going to say this is the answer. We're just here to say, this is not right. And here are all the ways in which it is not right. So it was a a, a gentler, uh, at least at the beginning form of, uh, of this nihilism. And I think it's still reverberating. I think a lot of the issues that are being discussed now wouldn't be talked about in our political landscape. They wouldn't be talked about in the media in the same terms, in the same, with the same level of openness uh, and recognition of inequalities were it not for the Occupy movement. When you think back, all of those things before Occupy, they were discussed uh, more like in bits and pieces uh, in different parts of the media, but the mainstream wasn't sort of putting it all together. Um, So is it political nihilism? Um, Yeah, CJ, I would say so, because um, they weren't out there, uh, you know, physically burning down buildings, but they were saying this whole structure has to come down. Something new has to be done. The structure is wrong. It's not just bits and pieces that are wrong. Right, so it's the it's nihilism in the sense that they wanted to <clears throat> destroy it and um, build something. It was irredeemable. yeah, and and see what comes out of it. See what happens after we take after we tear this down. Right, right. Well, that's yeah, that's probably true. Um, of course, Dostoevsky, you know, is very critical of this type of approach. Let's destroy it first, and then uh, see if something good will come come on the you know in, from the ashes, the phoenix from the ashes. Uh, turns out he was probably right in his being a skeptical. Um, about kind of a destruction first type of policy and also um, the means justify the ends. And the means justify the ends, by the way, is of course, 
part and parcel of this revolutionary uh, ethics, right? Anything just, you know, for, for, for the glorious goal of world uh, proletariat uniting and winning, et cetera. So in other words, we're going to kill you today for the glorious future tomorrow, okay? Is that okay? Um, so, <laughs> and I'm, I'm being sarcastic because, you know, it's very personal to me and to people that, uh, you know, to all of the people that were affected by it. In America, I think a lot of um, people that want to do, want to have a progressive outlook that don't have that historical, the same historical burden of your, if you will, or historical wound that a lot of people from Eastern Europe have from the years of communism, they're much more willing to do this type of uh, experimentation without realizing that, number one, again, to quote Shigalyov, I start with total freedom and I end up with total um, uh, despotism or and totalitarianism, <laughs> that's actually a very likely outcome because chaos breeds totalitarian type of rule, right? We know that we've seen that over and over and over again throughout history. And of course, the, uh, the idea of chaos is right there next to rises of Hitler, of Stalin, of Putin, of a lot of these people that come and say, you know, I'll, I'll guarantee safety, you just have to give up your rights, individual liberties, etc. And everybody, and most people say yes, because, you know, Maslow's pyramid of wants and needs, security is right there at the bottom rock, rock bottom of everything else. You have to have that first. Uh, Doug, did you want to comment? Well, yeah, and it swings a lot of unpredictable ways. I mean, the, the FBI, now we know, infiltrated the Black Panthers and some of the most violent voices came from FBI informants and people mm -hmm. hired by the FBI and to discredit the Black Panthers and to create a circumstance that they could be treated with violence. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very, the way various police forces around the world work is it's a very, very tricky situation. Right, right. No, no, it, for sure, for sure. But of course, you would argue that the, the czarist secret police infiltrated uh, Lenin's <laughs> party to, to, to create these false flags. <laughs> well, I, or would but you? there are things in this novel that sort of suggest there are cells <laughs> and then there are people in the cells that may be trusted, maybe not, yeah. and who are they really working yeah. for? And I mean, that's yeah. why Shadoff is killed. He's not really working for them. He's yeah, yeah. no, no, it's, it's yeah, for sure. It's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah, it's not as it's not as black and white as perhaps Dostoevsky would le lead us to believe. Uh, but I, I mean, that's time, kind. Of, that's kind of why I like Dostoevsky. There are a lot of loose cannons, a lot of bulls yeah. in the china shops. There. <laughs> uh, Jeannie, go ahead. Did you do you want to say something? <clears throat> I think that um, Mrs. Brzezinski maybe had had it right, and um, in all, all in all, the women in the book were the more balanced people. And when she was um, helping Mary give birth, she said something to the effect where, "Well, you know, right now we have this society and and all these useless people being born into it, and why don't we build a, a society first that." you know, we'll, we'll have some use for these people and then, you know, have the people to fill that use. Um, I, I think it's very apropos to what's going on today. I'd love to use it on, on the abortion issue. You know, if you, if you don't want people to have abortions, let's have a society where children have a good life. And, and then, you know, I think many women will be very willing and happy to have children. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, Madeline, uh, go ahead. Jeannie, thanks for bringing up that midwife. Uh, she was really something. Um, she was uh, full of vinegar <laughs> and uh, very rational, not religious. And uh, but remember, she she told Shatov. She said, "I will, you know, I will treat your wife for free because I liked what she said when we were abroad. I liked the way she thought." You know, you may have backpedaled, you may have backslid, but I liked her thinking. And it's just making me think, um, you know, maybe uh, I'm blanking on his name, but the person who 
uh, you all were just quoting, uh, maybe it was Strindberg, about, uh, about it having a sort of uterine imagery, <laughs> that there is this, um, there is an emphasis on birth and rebirth as well as all the death. Mm -hmm. um, and this does take place in winter, presumably spring will come. Um, and I, I'm wondering if he is, if he is maybe not in some logical way, but in some groping towards a solution way, uh, proposing that, that valuing of individual life and thought. Hmm. Uh, you talk about Dostoevsky. Da. <laughs> da. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure. Uh, uh, Allison and then Doug. I was just thinking about the. Is um, is Varvara Beatrice, in Dante, like, and there's some similarities that at the end. They forgive all. They take you in any way. They, um, they're sort of like, in, in some ways, like the mother figure who's kind of taking care of everyone and making everything okay. And it's, you know, the providing this stability and this comfort in a world that's just kind of really chaotic. Um, but it's kind of interesting the similarities there. It is. It is know? an interesting parallel for sure. I'm actually it's, kind of thinking of Arvar as much more forgiving than Beatrice. Which just was kind of kind of uh, ir she, uh, she read on the riot act, but she's still yeah forgave. irreconcilable until you repent. Uh, yeah. Barbara had a soft spot, and she saw him dying, and she's like a basket case, and she needs she yeah. needs to make peace with him. Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead, Doug. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting you say that. Vavara also reminds me of Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing. She's got a sharp tongue and she's more on the ball than Benedict. <laughs> you know, I mean, she understands things more. So it's interesting that Beatrice is a pickup. But I was going to comment on the Strindberg. I think Strindberg gets that from Nietzsche in The Birth of Tragedy. He talks about there are people who inseminate others with ideas and other people nurture them and carry them to birth. Mm -hmm. So he saw breakthrough thinkers as creating an idea, but other people developing it where it becomes useful or valuable. And, uh, and Bucky Fuller also thought the original engineers were women, that they stayed at home and invented ways to make life better while men went off to war. And then when they came home, they just ate, sat around the fire, drank and told war stories, you know, but the women were actually creating the tools to make things life better. So. He has a whole couple of essays where he talks about women as the first engineers. Thank you, Dr. Okay, well, uh, it's 7.35. I think we, we've had a good uh, discussion, two and a half hours. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. We will have one more uh, meetup to talk about demons, just uh, essentially a summary session where we'll look back on the entire work. So if you feel like you, you've you missed some things, this is your chance to go back and maybe reread some of those passages that you said you'd like to go back to reread. Because <laughs> you'll probably, I'm guessing you will probably never pick it up again in your life. <laughs> but uh, now is your chance, or in the next two weeks rather, is your chance to do it. Uh, I look forward to meeting again and maybe having a little more time to take in the entire work and think about uh, you know, what do we take from all this? Like, wh what's what's valuable here that that we want to remember? Maybe summarize some of the important points, uh, etc. So, anyway, I look forward to that. I will see you all in two weeks. Thank you, Philip. All right, thanks thank all. Thank you, Philip. Thank you so much, Phil. All right, sure, sure. <laughs>